Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your generous welcome. And what a job Wayne LaPierre just did. What an extraordinary man. I owe him a great debt of gratitude, and also to David Keene, who's been a friend and a supporter for a long time. And thank you to Chris Cox for that wonderful introduction. There's, there's one more person I would, uh, would like to introduce. Um, this is a, a hero of mine. I happen to believe that all moms are working moms. Uh, and if you have five sons, why, uh, you, your work is never over. My sweetheart, Ann Romney. Yeah. Say something. <laughs> You're welcome. Wow, this is fabulous. Let me give a shout out to all moms that are working. And, by the way, to all dads that are working. We love all of you. Um, you know, I often think that you're only, as a parent, as happy as your saddest child. And you never, ever stop being a parent. Our boys are grown now. They have children of their own. But it is such a, a wonderful opportunity for me to think about the heritage that we're leaving those children. And I love the fact that when uh, my kids were growing up, that we lived a stone's throw away from Lexington Green. And pretty soon, on April 19th, they'll be celebrating something again in Lexington, Massachusetts, the shot heard round the world. And how grateful we were for those patriots that had the ability to fight tyranny. And how grateful we are for all of you here today. You know, I've heard recently something, uh, how women were being referred to as a special interest group. And I thought to myself, really only Washington could do that. There's only one part of that phrase that's correct. Women are special. <laughs> we love this country. We love the people of this country, we've had an extraordinary experience going across and meeting tens of thousands of wonderful Americans that are so concerned about the future of this country. We recognize that we are heading in a direction that is perilous. We're also, and this is what I love the most, women are talking about the economy and jobs and about the legacy of debt that we're going to leave our children, and we are mad about it and we're going to do something about it in November. With your help, we need to make sure that we keep this country strong and fighting for the right reasons. So thank you all very much. We'll hear from Mitt. Thanks, Ruth. Okay. You bet. Thank you, sweetheart. And, and it is great to be with, uh, with so many friends here today from the National Rifle Association. Um, this organization is sometimes called a single issue group. And that is high praise when the single issue you're fighting for is freedom. And you can be proud of your long and unwavering defense of constitutional rights and liberties. Now, in about 207 days, we're going to do something that's really, really quite amazing. Americans will be choosing not only a president, but an entire House of Representatives and a third of the U.S. Senate. The entire world will be watching us. And by around uh, midnight on November 6th, maybe a little earlier, a little later, we'll know the results of millions of Americans exercising their right to vote. In doing so, Americans will be making a profound choice, a decision which is much more important than just one person or one party. We will not just select the president who will guide us. We will also choose between two distinct paths and destinies for the nation. So many of the big issues in the campaign turn on our understanding of the Constitution and how it was meant to guide our lives. It was one of Missouri's greatest sons, Harry Truman, who expressed a guiding conviction that you and I share in a ceremony that placed the Constitution 
and the declaration and the permanent care of the National Archives, President Truman offered a word of caution. Liberty, he said, can be lost, and it will be if the time ever comes when these documents are regarded not as the supreme expression of a profound belief, but merely as curiosities in a glass case. Truman believed, as we do, that the principles of the Constitution are enduring and universal, that they were designed not to bend to the will of presidents and justices who come and go, the belief that we are all created equal, that we are endowed by our Creator with our unalienable rights. These are not relics of another time. They reflect truths that are valid in every era. And the framework of law created by the Declaration and the Constitution is the source of American greatness. It has generated unparalleled opportunity and prosperity. Our founders understood this, which is why they created a system of government that's limited. President Obama is moving us away from our founders' vision. Instead of limited government, he's leading us toward limited freedom and limited opportunity. This November, we face a defining decision. I'm offering a real choice, a new beginning. I'm running for president because I have the experience and the vision to lead us in a very different direction. We know what Barack Obama's vision of America is. We've lived it this last three and a half years. Mine is very different. My course restores and protects our freedoms. As president, the Constitution would be my guide. The Declaration of Independence would be my compass. Now, today I want to talk about this administration's assault on our freedoms. First, our economic freedom, then our religious freedom, and then our personal freedoms. And I want to share my own plans to return America to the first principles of the nation. The American economy, it is fueled by freedom. Free people and free enterprises are what drive our economic vitality. The Obama administration's assault on economic freedom is the principal reason why the recovery has been so slow and so tepid, and why it is it couldn't meet their projections, let alone our expectations. The President's assault on economic freedom begins with taxes and his tax hikes. Of course, by their very nature, taxes reduce freedom. Their only role in a free economy is to fund those things that are absolutely essential, like national security and education and care for those who can't care for themselves. And yet this President has proposed raising the marginal tax rate from 35 percent to 40. The Vice President has now proposed a new global business tax. Medical device companies are soon to be subject to a new tax on revenues. And the President is now touring the country, touting a new tax on investment and the wealthy. Congress does not need more money to spend. It needs to spend only what it has. Now, the Dodd-Frank law is another example of the President's attack on economic freedom. It's an 848-page behemoth that's going to be followed by thousands and thousands of pages of new regulations. Now, regulations, of course, are necessary, but burdensome regulations serve only to restrict freedom and imperil enterprise. And the victims of the regulation are not nameless, faceless banks. They're employees, business owners, and customers who rely on banks that ultimately lose out. Now, under President Obama, bureaucrats are insinuating themselves into every corner of the economy, undermining economic freedom. They prevent drilling rigs from going to work in the Gulf. They keep coal from being mined. They impede the reliable supply of natural gas. They even tell farmers what their children can and can't do to help on the farm. Remember that old line from Will Rogers? He said that he worried whenever Congress was in session. 
Today, our freedom is never safe because unelected, unaccountable regulators are always on the prowl. And under President Obama, they're multiplying. The number of federal employees has grown by almost 150,000 under this president. Now, for centuries, the American dream has meant the opportunity to build something new. Some of our greatest success stories are of people who started out with nothing but a good idea and a corner in their garage. Today, Americans look at what it takes to start a business, and they don't see a promise, an opportunity. They see government standing in the way. The real cost of this isn't just the taxes that we're paying and the money spent complying with all the rules. It's the businesses that are never started, the ideas that are never pursued, and the dreams that are never realized. You know, we once built the interstate highway system and the Hoover Dam. Today, we can't even build a pipeline. We once led the world in manufacturing and exports and infrastructure investment. Today, we lead the world in lawsuits. We, we once led the world in educating our kids. Today, half the kids in our 50 largest cities won't even graduate from high school. If we continue along this path, we'll spend our lives filling out forms and complying with excessive regulations and pleading with political appointees for waivers and subsidies and permission. That path erodes freedom. It deadens the entrepreneurial spirit. And it hurts the very people it's supposed to help. Freedom is the victim of unbounded government appetite. And so is economic growth, and job growth, and wage growth. And as government takes more and more, there's less and less incentive to take risk and to invest and to innovate and to hire people. Th this administration thinks our economy is struggling because the stimulus was too small. The truth is we're struggling because our government is too big. I'm running for president because I have the experience and the vision to get us out of this mess. My agenda takes America in a right direction. It preserves freedom. It encourages risk-taking and innovation. It fosters competition. It promotes opportunity. Instead of expanding the government, I'm going to shrink it. Instead of raising taxes, I'm going to cut them. The answer for a weak economy is not more government. It is more freedom. Now, economic freedom hasn't been the only one of the Obama administration's targets. Our first freedom, our religious freedom, has also been under attack by this administration. You may have seen in a recent uh, labor regulation case, the government claimed that a church should not be free to determine who qualifies as a minister under the law. It claimed that the government should instead interfere with that decision. The government. The Constitution came to the rescue. We wonder what the court would do. They rejected the Obama administration's attack in a 9-0 unanimous decision. And, of course, now the Obama administration has decided that it has the power to mandate what Catholic charities and Catholic schools and Catholic hospitals must cover in their insurance plans for their employees. It's easy to forget how often candidate Obama assured us that under Obamacare, nothing in our insurance plans would have to change. Remember that one? Well, here we are, just getting started with Obamacare, and the federal government is already dictating to religious groups on matters of doctrine and conscience. 
In all of America, there's no larger private provider of health care for women and their babies than the Catholic Church. But that's not enough. That, that fact doesn't satisfy the Obama bureaucrats. No, they want the Catholics to fall in line and violate the tenets of their faith. As President, I will follow a very different path than President Obama. I will be a staunch defender of religious freedom. The Obama This, this regulation from the Obamacare folks is not a threat and insult to only one religious group. It is a threat and insult to every religious group. And as President, I will abolish it. I don't think I have to tell you this, but you know that like economic and religious freedoms, our personal freedoms have also been under attack. Few things are more important to us than our health and our health care. The Tenth Amendment preserves the right to choose our own health care, as well as all the rights not specifically granted to the federal government by the Constitution. It preserves those to the states and to the people. Obamacare violates the Constitution, and I'm counting on the Supreme Court to say exactly that. It's not just health care, of course, that this administration attacks. Um, Mike and Chantel Sackett, did you hear this story? They're, they're, uh, uh, they've learned firsthand how the Obama government interferes with personal freedom. They run a small business in Idaho. They, they saved enough money to buy a, a piece of property and to build a, a home on it. But, but just a few days after they broke ground, an EPA regulator told them to stop digging immediately. The EPA said they were building on a wetland. But the Sackett's property isn't on the wetlands register. As a matter of fact, it sits in a residential area. Nevertheless, the EPA told them that was a final decision and it could not even be appealed. Fortunately, the Constitution confronted the Obama administration again, and the Supreme Court ruled unanimously for the Sackett's and against the Obama EPA, just like they should. This administration's attack on freedom extends even to rights explicitly guaranteed by the Constitution. The right to bear arms is so plainly stated, so unambiguous, that liberals have a hard time challenging it directly. Instead, they've been employing every imaginable ruse and ploy to restrict it and to defeat it. I applaud true conservationists like Rob Keck who worked to preserve lands and herds and flocks for hunting. I applaud Ambassador Bolton for opposing international efforts to erode our rights. I, I applaud Congressman Issa and Senator Grassley for their work in exposing the Fast and Furious scandal. And of course, I applaud the NRA leadership for being among the first and most vocal in calling upon Attorney General Holder to resign or get fired. You know, we need a president who will enforce current laws, not create new ones that only serve to burden lawful gun owners. President Obama has not. I will. We need a president who will stand up for the rights of hunters and sportsmen and those who seek to protect their homes and their families. President Obama has not. I will. And if we're going to safeguard our Second Amendment, it's time to elect a president who will defend the rights President Obama ignores or minimizes. And I will protect the Second Amendment rights of American people.
You know, we've all seen enough of President Obama over the last three years to know that we don't want another four. In a, uh, in a, in a second term, he'd be unrestrained by the demands of re-election, as he told the Russian president last month when he thought no one was listening. After a re-election, he'd have a lot more, quote, flexibility to do just what he wants. Not exactly sure what he meant by that, but looking at his first three years, I got a pretty good idea. I mean, just, just consider the courts, for instance. He has a, an unusual view of the Supreme Court and its responsibilities, as he reminded us just the other day. He said, he said, uh, he said this. He said, I'm confident that the Supreme Court will not take what would be an unprecedented, extraordinary step of overturning a law that was passed by a strong majority of a democratically elected Congress. Of course, what President Obama calls extraordinary and unprecedented, the rest of us recognize as judicial review. That, that concept has been the centerpiece of our constitutional system for hundreds of years. Judicial review requires, requires, requires that the Supreme Court strike down any law that violates the Constitution. And the, that's the founding document of our freedoms. That's what they got to do. But, but, but President Obama seems to believe that court decisions are only legitimate when they rule in his favor. <laughs> and they're illegitimate if they don't. He thinks our nation's highest court is to be revered and respected as long as it remains faithful to the original intent of Barack Obama. You know, that, that's the problem with people who, who view the Constitution as living and evolving, not timeless and defining. They never want to explain just who it is that's going to decide what the Constitution means and in what way they would have it evolve. In his first term, we've seen this president try to browbeat the Supreme Court. In a second term, he would remake it. Our freedoms would be in the hands of an Obama court not just for four years, but for the next 40. And we must not let that happen. As president, I'll uphold the rule of law and put America back on the path toward the Founders' vision. I don't want to transform America. I want to return America to the principles that made this nation great. Our Founders began with this great American experiment. They created a nation conceived in liberty and then trusted us with the duty to preserve it and to defend it. In the generation since, more than a million Americans have made the ultimate sacrifice. One day towards the end of my, uh, my term as governor, my office got a call telling us that a soldier had been killed in Iraq. His casket was on a U.S. Airways flight back to Massachusetts, but his family hadn't been able to be notified in time to get to the airport to receive his remains. And, and so they asked if I would go to the airport in their stead. I said, of course. We, uh, we drove over to the airport and out onto the tarmac. The jet came in and the, uh, the people disembarked. And then the luggage began coming down the conveyor. And then after a little while, the casket appeared on the conveyor. The state troopers who were there with me uh, saluted. I put my hand on my heart. And then I happened to glance up at the terminal. And, and there in Boston, there's a big wall of glass at the US Airways terminal right where the plane had come in. And it seems that the people coming off the plane had seen all the police cars out there in the tarmac, so they stopped and went up against the glass to see what was going on. And then the people walking down the hall saw the people leaning up against the glass, and so they, they came in behind them and stood behind them. So there's a huge crowd there of people. And as I looked up there, I saw that every single person had their hand on their heart. When I think of our country, it seems like that that come to my mind. 
should I have the honor of serving as president. That's how I will seek to lead, not by pitting one group against another, but by bringing us together as Americans, patriotic, freedom-loving Americans. Americans want a leader who will tell them the truth, who will live with integrity, who will preserve the nation and protect our Constitution. We have a sacred duty to restore the promise of America, and we'll do it. And we'll do it because we believe in America. We'll stop the days of apologizing for success at home, and never again will we apologize for America abroad. There was a time not so long ago when uh, each of us could walk a little taller, stand a little straighter, because we had a gift that no one else in the world shared. We were Americans. That meant something different to each of us, but it meant something special to all of us. We knew it without question, and so did the world. Those days are coming back. That is our destiny. We we believe in America. We believe in ourselves. Our greatest days are ahead. We are, after all, Americans. Join me in this great cause. Let's take back our nation and defend our freedoms. God bless you. God bless the United States of America. Thank you so much. Thank you.